go into our uh, presentation. Um, we used uh, Airflow to build a scalable architecture for processing medical records. And uh, we're going to cover a few topics uh, on this call. First of all, why we're doing this, what sort of motivation, uh, what are the main challenges we're uh, trying to solve, why we chose Airflow to be key for, for, this, uh, for this effort, going a bit more into the details of our architecture and a few conclusions and let us know what we are working right now. Um, we're a uh, software company. We work on many different uh, verticals and this is um, kind of a, a new initiative that we have in the area of data sciences and machine learning. And in the context of our client project, we started to learn a lot about medical records and the uh, interaction between patients and physicians. Uh, we learned that physicians, they don't have a lot of time to review historical data during an appointment or during a, an inpatient uh, event, which is when the patient comes to see the, the physician. Um, in a, in, a, in a hospital or they are hospitalized or anything like that. So med uh, doctors, physicians, they usually come to us and they, they get really low quality data from, their, from the patients. Uh, we also have the challenge that historical data contains errors and it's very, very hard to summarize, to get the important data that you need from a potentially huge set of data for one specific patient. Um, we interviewed and uh, we run surveys across a lot of people with uh, almost 100 physicians and we interview a lot of them. And we got like really good insights uh, and it's kind of shocking. We got comments like, Okay, I spend more time dealing with my EMR than attending my patients. And for those, for those who don't know, EMR is the platform that they use for managing medical records. It's what the physicians um, have in their computer when, when attending a patient. They say that they, have, they do too many clicks, they don't have ways to visualize, visualize data, um, the interface is clunky, it's hard to read, there are notes everywhere, they, they don't have one single place to see a summary of the patient. So going a bit to the challenges, and uh, it's, uh, I'm going to go a bit more about uh, expanding on what uh, I already uh, said. This is an example of a typical medical record. Um, Data is non-structured, is written in plain English, but using a lot of medical lexicon, abbreviations, um, something that they call vocabularies, which are um, ways to abbreviate medical conditions or diagnoses, um, drugs that uh, are prescribed to, 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 to patients. And each patient, they he can have decades of history, uh, history that can come from different medical records platforms that they can have been migrated in the past. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, we're not going into imaginology on this talk. We're just focusing on text. Um, and it, it's potentially gigas of information, you know? And the, the big question here is what's really relevant, what's right, what's wrong, what's relevant, and what's relevant in the context of this appointment. It can be an appointment with a cardiologist or an oncologist, or you know, uh, or it can be an emergency. So different types of data are important for each one of these. Uh, of these encounters. So it has to be tailored. It has to be 
uh, context aware, and uh, we have to do a lot of work to, to, to get to that stage. Um, another big challenge, data quality. Uh, there are a lot of typing errors. Over, over the years, uh, physicians, they type uh, what the, the, the patients tell them, what they see on exams. Uh, they have their own mistakes. Sometimes, uh, and, uh, and I'd say most of the times, they copy-paste uh, prior uh, prior uh, appointments information, and they just uh, add new comments. There are OCR errors. Uh, a lot of data was migrated from uh, handwritten notes, and they have a lot of mistakes. Uh, you can find contradictory information, so you can you have to wait uh, reliability. Uh, what I said about different medical conve conventions for naming, abbreviations. It's extremely non-structured and there is a lot, a lot of data. And there is a lot of data for each person and, you know, that we have to process potentially thousands of or millions of medical records. Semantics is a big thing, you know. We have plain English with uh, errors, and we have to convert that into, into something that, if we are going to do summarization, uh, that's something that we, we, we have to rely a lot of machine learning techniques for that, and we need semantics. We need uh, something that we can create uh, statistic models on the top of that. Uh, it's not only a challenge of, uh, language recognition is fairly more complicated. We have many vocabularies, uh, and I can name a few, CPT, ICD-10, ICD-11, ICD-9, MESH, Paraxinorm. These are, are ways to define uh, um, exams, drugs, prescriptions, diagnosis, diseases. Uh, and uh, the first thing that we, we had to do was to transform plain text to a semantic network, one ontology to something that makes sense from a computing perspective. And we found uh, this is that's called Unified Medical Language System, which is um, ag aggregation of medical vocabularies of it creates an ontology, which uh, means you know a semantic network, a huge graph of representations of you know diagnoses, uh, drugs, uh, uh, symptoms, signals of things that can happen, characteristics of the patient, and it gives you a standardized way to represent all this. And if you have, let's say, a disease that has um, 50 different representations under, under different systems and abbreviations, it has, some, it has something called metathesaurus, which is like a huge dictionary of all these vocabularies. So this, this was a great opportunity to convert uh, our plain text into something uh, more semantic. The recent Apache project called CTEX, which basically it takes an input, which is basic plain text, and the output is a subset of XML. Uh, they are called XMI files. And it's, it's a representation of a semantic network following um, the UML standard. Uh, so, this is a this is a, a, a big part of, of our work. It's taking this plain text and running this uh, and creating this semantic network with a sequence of nodes and relationships. So, given given the, the, this context, this challenge, why are for? Because the most important thing by uh, by far is the data preparation and processing. Make sure that uh, before CTEX, 
a lot of data cleaning takes place. Uh, a lot of data preparation takes place. We have a diversity of problems. Different sources of data, they have different kinds of, uh, of problems. We, it's very important to have traceability, reproducibility. It's very important that if you have a task that does something very specific like fixing some kind of error in data, um, you can have different versions of this task and you can measure you know, uh, how effective it was. And you can improve uh, each task and have different versions of your deck that will actually have different outputs, uh, which consists of a different and a better input for CTAs. And that's the first step having a, a more polished, a, a, a cleaner uh, input for CTX. And to give you an example, after OCR, we had, you know, uh, first of January of 88, and, uh, and at the end of the OCR process, in the real medical record, we had 2088 insta instead of 1988. So, this is a typical problem and we have all types of problems. And the output, uh, it's summarizing. It's all about personalizing, tailoring. So also uh, Airflow gave us a great tool to create a data problem that could be tailored to the, the, the current needs. And you know, we, we could have conditions, we could have different versions of tasks, we can test different things, different machine learning models. And, uh, and that was all we needed to, to, to put in place this. Um, we had uh, an input, we had an output, we used Redshift to store each one of the individual intermediate outputs. And we could focus on uh, improving each one of the steps of the of our process, which consists again on data preparation, processing through CTX, which could do, we could do through Airflow, and post processing, which is summarizing data and tailoring for the specific needs. And again, we need to scale. We need to process thousands, millions of medical records. This is a process that takes a lot of time. And we have to parallelize everything that can be parallelized. And this is where uh, Spark and Kubernetes come, in, come into play. And now I will let Mika go into the details of, of that. Thank you, guys. OK, so now uh, I'm going to talk about the different steps uh, that we follow to build our architecture. Uh, so first of all, which data we use? We use EMRs data and public available data sets about uh, text medical records. And uh, what, uh, where we store the data, we choose uh, to store the data in S3. And uh, we develop uh, different tasks that resolve uh, the problems that we found where we manually analyze the data uh, to detect which uh, transformation we have to do uh, in order to prepare the data for our models. So each task uh, saves intermediate uh, results in Redshift, uh, that is our database. Uh, so uh, in this way, we can uh, create measurable tasks. Uh, after that, we have to prepare the data to CTAX. CTAX needs a specific format as input, and uh, we have to transform the data th that we have to, uh, to input this to CTAX. Uh, we choose Spark to, to execute each of our tasks since we are able to parallelize the work among different nodes and choose uh, how much CPU or memory we want to, to give that task to execute. Um, and also, uh, each of the tasks save the intermediate result. So it's um, uh, good to measure the time for each task 
and we have uh, the overall time for the processing. So we can find if we have different um, problems in each of the tasks, uh, correct the code uh, separately in, in each of the tasks, or even give more CPU or memory to execute faster. So um, also uh, having the task isolated give us the advantage to uh, to have the the opportunity to only uh, change what we need and uh, for each task. Uh, so we have to change only one component and not the whole, whole system. Uh, so after that, we have a C takes that uh, consumes this information and um, is able to produce the semantic network that we want. And we use also a task in Airflow to execute C takes inside a pod container in Kubernetes. Uh, so we did a custom image, a Docker image, uh, with C takes that executes a command. And uh, we, we are planning to use a pre-trained model that we can uh, customize uh, to improve the CTX output and find uh, the information that we want. Um, that is about the concepts, uh, UML's concepts that we can find the, regarding medical information about diseases or uh, different uh, types of information. And we want uh, each of the tasks that be reproducible. So the idea is that uh, if we have to execute the task again, the output will be the same. So uh, we don't have any errors. So after that, we are able to summarize the information. Uh, why we have to summarize? Uh, because the CTX output is a very huge uh, semantic network uh, with a lot of concepts. Uh, there are different concepts that uh, it can find. Uh, so uh, we have to reduce this information on uh, what is important. Uh, for this, uh, we choose to, to use machine learning since uh, it is a complex problem. Uh, because different physicians need different type of summarization. So uh, we, we think that this is the way to personalize our summary. Um, we, we find that Spark also has uh, libraries to, to train uh, models and use pre-trained models uh, in, inside the Spark cluster. So we use that. And uh, here uh, you can see a diagram of our architecture. So first of all, uh, we have the data in S3 and we use uh, the S3 to redshift operator to consume this data and transform uh, to it be available in the database. So then if each of the task that executes in, in Spark uh, that are part of the, the DAG in Airflow, uh, are able to consume the, this information and make the necessary transformations and store the intermediate results in, in the database. So after the, all the data preparation pro process, uh, we execute C takes in the pod container. And after that, uh, we are able to uh, execute the summarization task that also runs in, in Spark. And finally, uh, the final output, we transform it uh, from the database to S3 to be available to then use it. Uh, the, all the, the, the tasks run in the, in the Spark cluster, as I said, in PySpark, and the the all these components, uh, the the Airflow components and the Spark cluster run in Kubernetes, and to communicate between the Airflow and Spark cluster, we use Apache Libby, 
that is a REST API that lets you to execute a Spark task into the cluster. And taking a, a deeper look about how Spark works, we have um, a node uh, that is the main node called driver. This node is uh, in charge of dividing the work among the different uh, nodes. So it works with uh, data sets that is, are called resilient distributed data sets since they are distributed uh, around the nodes in the cluster. So the executor's nodes executes the, the work and when they are done, the Spark driver aggregates all the information and it generates the final output. Uh, the Spark uh, tasks are executed from Libby, so Libby invokes uh, the, the task, and uh, Airflow can ask Libby uh, amongst a certain time about the status of the, that um, task. Uh, in this way, we are not blocking the, the airflow um, and this uh, request. Uh, so it's asynchronous and uh, airflow don't have to wait until the task is finished. So we have uh, different takeaways from this experience. Uh, first of all, airflow. Uh, it, it was very good for our data pipeline and all the data preparation process to create a trackable task that uh, can be uh, reproducible. And um, it provides integration with uh, almost all the platforms. And if you uh, want to connect with a platform that uh, is not provided, you can create a custom operator to do that. So that, uh, that is uh, very good. And also, uh, it was uh, really helpful to uh, see in the, in the web the, the DAG uh, status uh, for each task. So uh, we can see like uh, the execution status in real time. Uh, one of the things that was kind of a struggle uh, was that we we want to be able to see uh, what are the impacts or errors that each uh, DAG version generates, and uh, this is not support in the in the in the website. So uh, we don't have that information. So if there is an error, we don't know which uh, version of the that was that generate that error. Uh, regarding Kubernetes and Spark, uh, it are tools that are very useful uh, to build our uh, scalable and isolate architecture. And uh, we were able to parallelize the work and improve our, our time, processing time. And uh, we have some problems uh, with the different versions that we use uh, when we update uh, to one version of Airflow. We have uh, different problems in, in the cluster to resolve. And also, uh, the learning curve uh, for DevOps is uh, very, very large. Uh, there are different things that we have to take into account. Uh, to create this architecture and configure the, the cluster. Um, well, this is uh, a work in, in progress. We have uh, different things to do. Uh, first of all, we, we know that Airflow is not for streaming, so we are planning to use a Spark streaming to uh, have more information coming to our cluster. Uh, we want to reuse our architecture and break down into different components that can be uh, open source pro projects to use to different things uh, because we think that uh, it might be helpful for other type of projects. And regarding the summarization, we have a lot of work to do there to improve our summaries. 
and make them personalized to each uh, type of uh, physician. Well, thank you very much. And um, we are here to listen to uh, questions.